<laughs> this is, uh, I, I took this. It's just one of the Strombergs running on the test stand. There's idle. The transition. The butterfly isn't open that much. No, it doesn't. It kind of does there. So, for in order for fuel to uh, vaporize, it, you have to. It absorbs what? Heat. So keep that in mind when you're running the GPU. You have an intake pipe. That pipe will get ice on it. It is super cold. Yeah. Let's see what I want to go to here. Stromberg. There we go. All right. So this is pretty much what we did. Stop that. This is not what I wanted to happen. All right. I don't know what's going on here. Try to just make it bigger. Guess I can't. Okay. Get to this laser pointer. But I just wanted the whole thing bigger, but you guys can see that okay? Yeah. Yeah. I guess actually it's kind of big right there. So we really just talked about all of this and more or less drew this carburetor. So, you know, let's kind of run through it. So we have the fuel inlet that comes from where? Okay, so in an actual aircraft system, you're going to have the tanks are high. Okay, it's going to flow down to the lowest point of the aircraft in the bottom of the firewall. Why are you really taking a picture of this? You have an entire thing like in the lab. <laughs> you can go ahead. I don't mind. You want me to? <laughs> I'm waiting. You done now? Trying to, no. Trying to make it cool. <laughs> uh, so it goes to the lowest point of the aircraft. That's called a gas later. Right? And it's uh, some airplanes, it's a little glass bowl. A lot of, a lot of them now, they're what's up? Glass. Aluminum, bolt. yeah, they're, they were glass back in the day, and uh, just a screen or something, and so it'll catch contaminants, and then you can look in the glass bowl, and if you see a little separation with water, so every day, every, every pre-flight, you drain that out, then check it for water and stuff, then it goes from there right into the carburetor when it goes past a little screen right there. Uh, I think all fuel control units have some sort of little screen, and you want to check that periodically. Um, what would periodically be? 100. 100 hours. I would say every 100 hour or annual, or whatever the book says, but that's generally the accepted. No later than an annual, no more than 100 hours. So whichever, I would say whichever comes first. You know, some of these rental planes are flying two, three, 400 hours in a year. I would not wait until the annual. I would definitely check it. All right, so past the needle and seat. You have to be very careful with these little needles and seats. Uh, Stromberg, I guess all of them have gone through some material changes. Um, they were steel. Then they tried Delron, which is a white plastic. They tried a little rubber right there. But, you know, rubber and fuels don't always get along. The Delron, I think, was okay. The steel is kind of the preferred, but they don't really seal as well as they should. I just bought a brand new needle and seat for my um, carburetor. It was really, really cheap. Take a, take a guess. 600. Ah, oh, it's cheap. 100. 100, yep. Yeah. How many AMUs is that? That's like a... <laughs> a fifth of an AMU? Yeah. Okay, so it fills up the float bowl. The float level is, ironically, not ironically, right below the discharge nozzle. 
What happens if the fuel level is just above the discharge nozzle? When does it leak out? All the time. Oh, yeah, while well, it's sitting there in the, in the hangar. So you walk up in the morning like, wow, that's a lot of blue staining on the ground. Well, Stromberg's have this little problem in that if you, it's perfect, it's still going to leak everywhere because these seats don't work that well. They just never did in Stromberg's. That's why I have you take three readings. And if you read the book, you're supposed to take them over time. And, and uh, yeah, so they leak anyway. So the 140 that I flew, it was always a matter of, principle or a matter of, of procedure, I should say, that you always turn the fuel off when you get out of the airplane. So you get in the airplane, turn the fuel on. Now that's a, if you're used to that, that's one thing. If you're not used to turning a fuel valve off, that can be pretty dangerous. A lot of people have died because they don't have the fuel valve on. There's enough fuel in there to start up an airplane and start to take off. But there's not enough fuel in there to start the airplane, let it warm up, do a proper pre-run, then take the run. You'd run out of fuel long well, before that. You should know that you need to turn your fuel on. I know, but people do weird things. So, um, in all of the airplanes I've flown with, uh, the not the Stromberg, but the Marvel Shoveler, um, it's like my airplane, I never turn the gas off. Never, ever. I mean, if, I'm, if it's off, it's because I'm doing maintenance. And then when I'm done the maintenance, I turn it right back on. I mean, it's I'm in the middle of maintenance right now, and it's on so turn it back on so all right so fuel levels right above there if it's not you're going to get it leaking out well okay so it leaks out when it's off what does it do when you're running does it still leak out okay so what is that going to make the mixture rich. why is it rich too much, fuel. too much fuel so part of this this whole rich lean thing and how it's set up is a function of number one float level that is a huge part of it plus the main metering jet has something to do with it um, there is something called well i guess we did that a little bit um i did have a slide up here i don't think that way back here way back there, there we go fuel metering head and we're i don't think your book talks about that at all so I really haven't been asking about that, but with the fuel metering head is what? It's a little tiny space right there. So I'm going to say that is the distance the fuel has to go before it leaves the nozzle. Oh. Mm -hmm. Way back over here. It's got to be an easier way. Back there. Okay. So we got that. That's important. We talked about the 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 air bleed right here, the main air bleed, which does what to the fuel? Emulsify. Emulsify is the word I'm looking for. All right. Um, we got the main metering jet. Main metering jet is too big. What happens? Too rich. Too rich. What if it's too small? Too lean. What if the air bleed gets plugged up? Doesn't emulsify. Doesn't emulsify, so it's going to run? Too rich. Lean. Okay, is, is it going to run lean because you're not getting enough air? This is an important point because I think a lot of you are like, well, it's going to run lean because you're not getting enough air because you plugged up some of the air. Fuel that can't be burnt. It's not going to come out of the nozzle very well. It's nothing to do with the air. The fuel isn't working well. All right. Okay, um, the idle circuit over here, which is, you just kind of have to know how the, the drawing is drawn. So this is the main discharge nozzle. So what are they indicating right here? Well, here's the inlet right here. That's the inlet, that's the inlet. So it just turns. So what is this full of right now? Fuel. Fuel, it's just sitting there and it comes up through the discharge, the idle tube, which is full of fuel and? Air. air. So notice that the main, the air bleed is behind the Venturi. Venturi, behind the Venturi is a great place to get just ambient air pressure. Okay. So then we've got the discharge nozzle we talked about. There's two. If I screw this screw in, does my, I, what is this screw again? Idle, idle mixture, which only does what? Just the mixture at idle. If I screw it in, it gets? 
Why does it get lean? Pinching off of the fuel and air. Pinching off fuel. Don't say air. I, I didn't shut off air. The fuel and air mixture. The nope. Air. Nope. Nope. I know what you're saying. Mm. But let's make sure that we all speak the same language. After this, this place right here with this pink and this blue meat, that is fuel and air mixture. Right here where it turned pink? Just fuel. Just fuel. Notice, it's just metered fuel. Well, I, I figured it just wasn't on there because usually nope. on the grass they'd have like the dots in there. With There's some dots in there. You can't see it well. There's some dots. What are the dots? That's the emulsified air, the, the vaporized air, right? That's nope. Aerated fuel. So and it's a little bit of bubbles in there to emulsify the fuel. Is that a fuel air mixture? No. It's not a fuel air mixture. Is it a mixture of fuel and air? Yes. Yes, yes it is. Is it the fuel air mixture? No. It is not. So <laughs> it is just fuel with a few bubbles in it. Okay. okay, so when you say fuel air mixture, it's got to be mixed with this blue or this yellow here. In this case, it's, well, in this case, it's light blue. Right here, that's a fuel air mixture. Okay, right here, fuel air mixture. Right here, it's not a fuel air mixture. Bubbleized fuel, if you'd like. What about here? More bubbleized fuel. Bubbleized fuel. It's a new thing I just Bubbly made up. Bubbly fuel. Bubbly fuel. Bubble fuel. Okay. <laughs> Got that? Oh my God. Because fuel air mixture is when we're talking about ratios. And mm -hmm. so if I screw this in, the carburetor gets leaner. Why? Fuel. Pinching off the fuel. 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 I pinch off air? Nope, just fuel. Pinched off, pinched off. Such great words. All right, we, we, uh, we did though. Pinched off a little bit of fuel. Okay, is there anything I haven't covered except for the manual mixture control? Okay, so this does fill up full of fuel and it's completely full. And so that means this is completely full of fuel in idle. And so when I open the throttle, it has to pull out all of that fuel that is sitting. Actually, it sits, it fills up this entire tube. So it's not just here, it's this entire tube is going to be full of fuel to right there. See that? Yeah. And so that's your accelerating well. It's just, so when you open the throttle, it's all this fuel has to come out. That's gonna be extra rich when we do that until it gets out of the idle air tube or the, the uh, main air bleed, and then it starts to go. Kind of weird, it's the way it works. That's turned on its side though. Why is why is that pink on the left and red on the right? Pink on the it, left. So on the right it says metered fuel there, but then when you go over to the other picture, it says the metered. Well but imagine if you went from nothing, your engine's not on, then to idle, you'd yeah. have that fuel sitting there. Right well it's, it's turned ninety degrees, one picture. So this tube right here, that right there, is this tube right here. I don't know if that helped yeah, or not. I'm just, yeah, sorry. I guess the reason it's not, it's red and not pink is because it's at idle. Yes, and this is just stagnant fuel. It's just, it's tech, unmetered fuel. Hasn't been metered, just sitting there. I know, why is it unmetered fuel? Because it's past this right here? I don't know, they could have. Yeah. But I think they're just trying to make a distinguishing yeah. difference here. It's Because it's an idle, so the metered is right here. So yes, this is metered fuel, but it's, it's not, metered. not metered idled fuel. Yeah. yeah, good point. Okay, so that brings me to the mixture control, which some of you did a fantastic job of figuring this out. Nice. Who's that? I said not. Oh, okay. So let me see, what do I have colors here? Okay, yellow. So this is, Mm, that's probably not a good idea. Yellow, some light blue. This is light blue. Okay. So light blue is suction. Yellow is regular air. Okay. So let's see. Let's fix this. So we got regular air. Comes up like that. So that's all yellow. So I have two sources of air. Now. Uh oh, oh, it still works. Thought, thought it crashed. There. All right. 
So on top of the float chamber, we must have some sort of air. Generally speaking, it's going to be atmospheric pressure. All right. So if I have atmospheric pressure on top of the float chamber and I have suction at the main discharge nozzle, I have a difference of pressure. air pressure. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what the name for that is? Pressure differential. Fuel metering force. That's what it is. I would not have called it that because it's air pressure. Why call it fuel metering force? We're going to talk about a different kind of fuel metering force later. I hate that term, um, but anyway, that's fuel metering force is the difference of air pressure. I, you should have called it air metering force. That would have made more sense. Okay, but they don't. So there we go. So you have, if you have ambient pressure over the float and you have a suction there at the discharge nozzle, you have a difference of potential and you're going to get X number of fuel. Now what if, because I'm notorious for stuff like this, I take and I take this and I put shop air into there. 100 PSI. Well, I'll tell you, it'll make that float flat as a pancake. Don't ask me how I know that, um, but it will. How do you know that? <laughs> don't, I said don't ask me, because <laughs> I ruined a float. That was a good story with that. There was a good story with that. It was about a, a mechanic. And I go back to don't ever ask somebody troubleshooting help if they're not fully engaged. And it was an engine that we had just overhauled the engine and the carburetor, and it would start, and it would go, and die every time. I mean, it just... They took the carburetor part over and over and over, and it was, you know, oh, you know, it's something's blocking a passage, this and that, and, you know, and I'm just walking by working on something else. You know, what do you think? I'm like, well, if it's a blocked passage, I guess air will, shop air ought to blow it out, right? And I, I go about my business, and then I come, they come back with these floats that are just, just smashed, you know, a $100 set of floats. So I'm like, what'd you do? Well, I put shop air into there. Well, yeah, I can see how that would happen because... <laughs> there's no way it's not going to get out it's a very tiny little passage right there it's going to pressurize that and those floats are just very small tin anyway so if i did put a lot of pressure in there other than the fact that it's going to smash the floats what's it going to do here really really fast right so that's a huge pressure differential okay so not do that so what if what if then i take and I pull a vacuum on this. You know, you got those little handheld vacuum things, or even hook it up to a shop vac. What, what's that going to do to my output while it's running? Less fuel, right? Yeah, yeah. So if it's a if it matches right here, a vacuum and a vacuum, then I'm getting no nothing. Fuel. Or like if I took this and just vented it to right here, would I get any fuel flow? No. Okay, so we got that. So the way they do this is a back suction is what it's called. So I've got this channel right here. So under normal circumstances, and I'll use a color that you can actually see, under normal circumstances, ambient air comes up through here, through here, and right into here. And it fills ambient pressure. Oh, by the way, there does happen to be this suction which is on here but you'll notice that it's a small tube, and this one over here with ambient air is a pretty big tube. So yeah, it's a suction, and it's pulling it out this way. And so it's gonna take a little bit of my ambient air and draw it out under normal circumstances. No big deal, because this tube right here is so big that, and if we look, let me see, there we go. That tube is so big, and this one is, oh, it's pretty small, so this supplies We'll say twice as much air as it needs through this tube over here. And so you robbed a little bit of suction. So what? Okay? So what do I have on top of my float now? Atmospheric, Atmospheric pressure. Yeah, robbed it out a bit here. Who cares, right? All right. But when I go to, we'll look up here. When I go to, come on. Here we go. When I go to lean, what I've done is I've choked this down. And so now, this is all the way lean, this ambient pressure, it's trying to get through there and really what little bit gets in there ends up going out the suction. So that's gonna draw from here. 
And so that is going to tremendously lessen the pressure on top of the float because it's now being all sucked out because there's not enough of this yellow or ambient air supplying that need. So it's got to suck it from somewhere. So it's going to suck it from over here. So what's that going to do to the pressure on top of the float? So if you decrease that pressure, that gets closer to this pressure, therefore you lean it out. Does that system work at idle? No. Why not? Okay. It's all about where you get your air from. Look at this passage right here. Yeah, oops, we got a laser. This passage right here is where? Right, right at the top of the Venturi. At idle, what is right at the top of the Venturi? No. This is idle. It's right it's right there. So what kind of pressure is that? Atmosphere. 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 So that makes this tube yellow and this tube yellow and this tube yellow and you can do anything you want with this but if all the tubes are yellow you're always going to get atmosphere. Okay, so this takes us kind of, and we'll talk about Stromberg a little bit very soon. When we talk about the Stromberg carbon, sorry, the Marvel Shebler, the, not this one, the next one, and we had that, that butterfly valve that was the manual mixture control that actually physically shut off the fuel. When you do that and you pull out the knob, what are you going to see on your RPM gauge if your engine is set correctly? High and then what? Not back down. Dies. Dies. Very important. Because I said, I've had so many students go, well, doesn't it go like to 50 RPM high and then just goes back to where it was? No. Um, goes up 50 and then dies. Die. So you have people with this, this particular carburetor pull their mixture out and they're staring at that and it doesn't work. And so they say, Strawberg, a piece of shit. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Does it work? Yes. yes. Works absolutely fine. It's, Works great. It doesn't work at idle. It's never was supposed to. It can't, That's right? That's what your idle mixture is for. Uh, not for, but you can't kind of turn it off. Oh, yeah. So it's not what it's for. It's something else. So, yeah, you can never pull it. So, there, and you'll see it. I mean, it's just the entire, like, most of the industry is like, these things don't work. Mechanics the, are saying that it doesn't work? Mechanics say it. Pilots say it. Oh, yeah. So they just don't understand. They just don't understand why it doesn't work. I'm telling you, that's why it doesn't work. It's never was supposed to. So they'll say, well, you know, why, why waste money? D number one, as a pilot, don't waste your time trying to pull the mixture back. It won't work. Uh, number two, if your mixture cable breaks, don't waste time replacing it. Just wire it, safety wire it to the full rich because it didn't work anyway. Um, you know, they're just garbage. You should get a different carburetor. And then I've seen some stuff where people talk about, oh, you know, the reason why they don't work is because those plates aren't mismatched. And, you know, if you spend a lot of time polishing them and getting it perfect. Okay, so let's see. Who's ran their car? Only one group has run it yet, right? Yeah. Does it work? Yes. Yeah. Your, your crappy-ass studentized carburetor that was thrown together out of, out of makeshift parts and it's scratched and the plates are mismatched, does it work? Yeah. Works really well, doesn't really it? Well. Really well. Actually, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. The system works. Okay. Woo! I got all that. Coconut technology. That was kind of fast. Okay. No, that was August. That's coconut. Well, I guess we have a choice here. Go home early? Go home. That is not a choice. That is not a choice. I can go back through and start writing a bunch of notes, or we can move on and just look at too many notes. We can look at the uh, Marvel Shoveler carburetor. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's do that. The Marvel VC Chevy. Or. Chevy Lights. Let me see. I guess that page. All right. Since we. Uh, slideshow. Current slide. Nope. That's not what I wanted it to do. Fine, from beginning. Why does it keep doing that? It hates me. 
this is faster. All right, let's go back to some of the slides we kind of missed out on the other day. We talked about fuel coloring. This was one of them. We talked a lot about, um, about this. This is, as you can see, uh, effects of fuel air ratio on flame propagation. Um, let me see, propagation rate. This has to do with the speed. I don't think that was, let me see. The speed of the flame. So your speed is at best mixture. You have your fastest flame. Got it. And as you go lean, the time that it takes to burn is going to, well, the propagation rate decreases, which means that it spreads slower. So it's a slow burn. And rich also is a slow burn, but which one is more slow? Yes, yeah, so it will stop burning about here, and over here it keeps on going. So, talked about that. So, um, that came into play with our exhaust gas temperature, uh -huh. right? And so, when we, we start messing with um, all things being equal, if we delay, and I, I use this one more with the spark plug because it makes more sense. If you try and tie it into lean and rich, you're like, wait a minute, it just really can mess with your mind. But if you can decrease the flame propagation, then your EGT is going to go up because it's still burning when it goes out. If you can speed it up, EGT, all things being the same, if you speed it up, then EGT goes down because it's all burned by the time it opens up. Uh, chart of best power mixtures for different power settings. Let me see best power. Let me see. We have best power here. Best, uh, let me see what we got. For four. So, okay, it's same, yeah. It's basically, it's the same engine, but here's 3150 RPM, 3000 RPM. I don't know what the hell's spinning that fast. And it was just a chart for best power mixtures. Ah, we don't need to worry about that. Um, ah, there's that EGT gauge I kept drawing up on there. So that's the original. With the asterisk. With the little asterisk. And you have... Two settings right there, hole right there and a hole right there. This one right here adjusts the yellow line. The yellow line is? Each one of these is 25 degrees. So that line just happens to be set at 75 degrees off of peak, 75 degrees cooler of peak. So this pilot's probably running his engine. 25 degrees, or I'm sorry, 75 degrees richer peak. Yeah, and this small hole down here adjusts this white needle. Which is that's your actual gauge. Uh, so you go up and you uh, fl so you fly it. And I, I I had to replace my gauge. You go up, take go up to five eight thousand feet, lean it until the needle stops moving, find its peak, and let's just say it peaks out right about here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Comes with a little tiny screwdriver. You put it there and you just adjust it until it peaks right there. Yeah. So the asterisk is supposed to be your peak. And you just manually adjust it. And of course, nowadays you have all these different gauges. I had this one in my 150. And, and uh, oh, all right. um, this is the drawing that I, I like the most that I attempted to draw up on there. All right, so I had to add to it. So we have 50 degrees lean of peak, 50 degrees rich of peak. So exhaust gas temperature is peaked right there. Follow? Okay, so 50 degrees rich of peak cylinder puts us peaks. right about Basic here. Peak cylinder head ah, so this chart shows it a little on the back side. But if we get another 25 degrees, we're way down over here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, as opposed to 50 degrees lean of peak, you're way down here. But look at the percent power. Way, way down. down here to right over here. So, you know, I like that over here. That's max power. All right, but then we can look at specific fuel consumption, which is like your miles per gallon or your economy. So, a little bit better at 50 degrees lean. Rich is here, but if you're gonna run at 25, 75, you're right here. If you're gonna run at max power, you're way up here. So, big difference. So, your best Specific fuel consumption, your best miles per gallon would be right about there, which is right about peak EGT because you're extracting the most heat energy out of the fuel. So why don't we run it here? 
Because you're extracting the most power out of the least amount of fuel. Yeah, but that's a good thing. So why don't we just say run it at peak EGT? What's too hot? Cylinders are fine. Valves. Sauce valves. Sauce valves. Yep. All right. And so they haven't come up with a way to make more heat resistant valves. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Oops. Everything. This is something I got out of, uh, well, source, Back to the Future, the WAD method, leaning by George Brown. Remember the WAD method, right? Aeronautical division. Uh, but what they were talking about is um, continental fuel injectors, uh, standard fuel injectors. And this is just kind of getting out there. But there's, when we talk about all this stuff, we make it sound like it's all like one cohesive unit. But your engine is doing six different things. And this demonstrates that with six different lines. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we go back to that slide I just showed you, which, you know, we spent some time on. That's for one cylinder. But now we've got to think about six. And so here's a snapshot right here. And we can see that we've got one cylinder that's peaked over here and another one that's peaked way over here. You know, and so your EGTs for fuel flow are completely changing. So this one peaked out at 1.45 gallons per hour. This one's peaking out at 13.75 or 25 gallons per hour. So you have this huge spread. So this becomes the problem is that it's really kind of difficult to actually get an engine to do all of the same things six times, which is where GAMI came in, General Aviation Modifications Incorporated, that's it. And so they're the ones that are doing these fuel flows that are actually matched to your cylinder and they get all of these peaks all kind of lined up and so the thing makes more sense. EGT, look at those temps. That one's at 15 something, this one's down here at 1475. So these are kind of high, so what does that tell you? They're running it right at EGT? Hmm? No. Well, peak EGT is right here. Not peakies right here. So they're what? Well, EGT, they're, they're running no. The leaner. If no. It's burning later. It's burning in the exhaust. No. No. So 1500 degrees. 15. Yeah, a little over 1500 degrees. Is it running fine? Yeah. It's the rear cylinders. Why are the EGTs so high on this air in this this aircraft? Oh, oh, okay. uh, probes are just higher. Yeah. You want to? How do you cool it off? Stick it down lower. Hey, just put the probe down another couple inches. So, you know, the, the kit that I put in, the JPI kit, says right in there, your probe should be somewhere between, I forget what it was, something, like three inches, right about three inches. If three inches isn't practical, then put it somewhere else. Just don't put it too close because you'll burn up probes and make sure they're all about the same, which good luck with that. Couldn't that also be affected by the baffling? We talked about that. And baffling will not affect EGT. That's cylinder head temp. Oh, okay. So exhaust is, is just running. Yeah. Hey, we watch that. Talked about the fuel metering head, that little difference there. I don't think that comes up anymore. Uh, mixture controls. Oh, we'll get to that later. Different kind of mixture controls. Automatic mixture. I guess we got to run before we can. All right. Hmm, can I do it off this? Yeah. Well, this is the drawing that we're going to be using, but I, I'm afraid you'd be like, what? But there we go. We can use this one. Same thing, MA4-5. Um, that's the smaller version, the one you'll be working with. There's not a lot different about this carburetor, but we can go through it right now so you have it somewhat of an understanding when you get to that point. So we kind of watch for things. Let's, let's take a look at what we learned. What's the first thing we're looking for? Air. Air and fuel. Okay. Air. Air flow is here. Mm -hmm. By the way, air is coming from the bottom up, so that makes this what kind of carburetor? Updraft. Called an updraft. updraft. Cars are generally speaking downdraft because they're on the top why why do we have updrafts in aviation instead of downdrafts blocks the view of the pilot blocks the view of the pilot get everything down below 
All right, let me see if we can go here. We got red. We do red. Oh, fuel. Fuel is blue. All right, fuel strainer. So that must mean the fuel comes in the through the top through the needle and seat. What's different about this needle and seat? Needle's going up. Yep, it's upside down. So same thing though. Float goes up. There it is. All right. So it's going to fill up this whole chamber down here. And now we're going to look around, see over here we've got our yellow was air before. Can I use yellow? Not really. Not really. Yeah, you're right. I can't. So we got air coming up through here. Here's my Venturi. All right. So what's my fuel path to get over to here? Let's do the idle circuit. So fuel has got to come down. Right here, this is the control. mixture control. Mixture control. <laughs> so this little thing slides over. It can block it off, mm -hmm. right? Making it smaller than the main metering jet. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, fuel comes through here, out the little uh, valve, through the main metering jet, mm -hmm. up into the main discharge nozzle. Okay, so it fills up the main discharge nozzle up to this line right here. So there's fuel sitting right there. Well, if I'm in idle, it comes through the main metering jet into the main discharge nozzle around into the idle circuit. So we have, again, an idle fuel jet. Seem familiar? Okay, idle fuel jet. We've got a bleed off to the side and one, two, three passages out. Okay, so what's in this passage right here? Fuel. With a little bit of bubbles. bubbles. That's metered fuel. We got an idle mixture control. Screw it in, it gets cleaner. Screw it out. Richer. 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 All right. So that's pretty dang easy. All right. Um, I guess that's it for the idle circuit. So you can see right here, as the throttle valves right here, how many lines do I have that are being used? One. One. As I open a little bit more, I've, then I will have two. two, and I open a little bit more, I'll have three. three, because you're getting more and more air, and then eventually you're going to run off the main discharge nozzle. All right, so main discharge nozzle. Let's talk about that. We've already went through here. Uh, oh, by the way, when I close this off, it closes fuel to the system, and it dies. Okay? So up to the main metering jet. They do call it a power jet, by the way. Main metering jet, right on through, but we need an air bleed. All right, this is something that it's a little bit of, a little bit of problem here. Um, this is the big old carburetors have this, like the one on my airplane, the MA45, which is pretty big. Um, but all of the smaller ones, the MA3 SPAs, MA3s, MA4s, not the 4-5s, they don't have this economizer thing. We'll talk about that later on. So you can just ignore that. Your carburetor won't have this. You're just going to have a, a spot where it just pulls in bleed air from behind the Venturi, just like everything else, and mixes it up. Now, on the, the bigger carburetors, and I'm going to come back around to this, but this is a really confusing thing. Some carburetors call, they have an enrichment system. Some have what they call an economizer system. So let me see. Let me try and unconfuse you on that. So I told you that a carburetor is designed so that idle, it's rich, and then cruise, and then full power. Okay? So this is rich, this is lean, and this is idle, and this is wide open throttle. All right, so if a carburetor by design, try to make this make sense, all by itself looked like, come on, looked like this, and it did this. And something made it do that. I would call that an enrichment. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay, it makes sense. And if by design, heck, i got to find the other program, I think. We'll figure it out eventually. If by design the carburetor looked like this and something caused it to go down, I would call that an economizer. I would. 
the they don't. No. They could just whatever. As Phil said, it's just another word for another thing that does the same thing that something else does. Exactly. <laughs> but if you can, but if you can understand, a power enrichment by name should enrich in this carburetor when it um, goes into wide open throttle. And conversely, if it's called an economizer, it should make the carburetor more economical during that cruise phase. Right. Yeah. But they may not do that. The economizer may just add fuel at wide open throttle. Then why'd you call it an economizer? Well, I don't know. It's because, you know, it's just, it seemed like a thing to do at the day. Saving you money so you don't run it lean and break your engine. And so if we look at this one, let's digest this just a little bit. This right here is the accelerator pump. Mm -hmm. All right, so when I accelerate, it pushes this down and it forces fuel this way into its own separate jet and out, just for a brief moment. And this is why when I hand you a Marvel Shebler with an accelerator, don't look over it and open the butterfly valve unless you have safety glasses on. You will get sprayed in the face, and I will laugh. So, sorry, I just will because it's funny. So, and they are full of fuel and stuff even now, so don't do that. But if you must, at least let me watch. Okay, so knowing that, knowing that, that down is full throttle, so when I go full throttle, it's going to push on this economizer needle that will close off this air bleed and cause less air to come in through here, causing the carburetor to go richer, causing it to go richer at wide open throttle. It is called an economizer, but it makes the carburetor richer. richer. Well, I guess somebody could argue that, no, it doesn't. It's a lot richer to begin with, and as I back off on the throttle, it opens up this air bleed, thus economizing it. So, I don't know. Six one, yeah, it's like, how did Phil say it? It's just a different name for a different thing, which is the same thing as something else. Yep. All right. You don't have this economizer valve on the carburetors you guys are working with. But we have the accelerator. Some of you will have an accelerator pump. Some of you will not. Some of you will have an economizer bleed. Some of you will not. There's different versions of these carburetors. So make sure you know yours, not the one next to you, because they are different. That's the fun part about that part of the class. All right, so this plunger, how does it work? Well, there's two check valves, a check valve here and a check valve here. So when you go up, fuel comes through here, upsets that check valve, fills this up, and it sits there. And then when you accelerate rapidly, it pushes this down. It can't go this way, so it goes through this one up and sprays in, and that's your accelerator. There is a spring on here that, so if you rapidly accelerate, if there wasn't a spring, you could only accelerate at a rate this would go down and push fuel through that little hole, mm -hmm. which would not be good. If I want a rapid acceleration, I want it. I don't want to be hydraulic locked. So you can mash the throttle and then the spring will take up some tension and then push it down, which is not necessarily good. But wow, that's all there is to this. There's some pretty smart people behind this. Right, well, there's not, you know, there's not a whole lot more I could say about this particular thing. Um, yeah, so we talked a lot about the mixture control. It's just a manual one. But wait. Okay. Um, this is a representative. This is the 4SPA, one of the carburetors you will be working on. There is a problem with the drawings, and that, that tube right there should be colored in. It's hard to see. So we got mixture control, throttle stop, economizer channel. This has an economizer channel. And so the economizer channel, I'm going to kind of leave to you to sort of figure out, but what you're looking for, I'll kind of explain it. So economizer channel, you can see that it's, this is the economizer hole. And what is right here? Right. in line with the shaft. Okay. Oh, okay. So now it's closed. What do I want an economizer to do? Give it fuel. Back light up the control. 
That would that would not be economizer by my definition. No, but it's that would be a power enrichment. But by my definition, what do I want an economizer to do? Lean it out. Lean it out. Pull that down. When? Cruise. 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 All right. So what I'm looking at, and I don't know if we can, if you can find some information. Hey, let me know. As you open this throttle up and expose this passageway to this, what kind of air pressure do I have right here? So if I'm adding a vacuum down to the float chamber, what am I going to do? Yep. And when it's wide open, when it's wide open, there's no effect on that. Because because pressure here gets very close. It's one inch below atmospheric, so it's very close to atmospheric. Kind of like a stronger mixture. It's a lot like that, isn't it? So I believe that's exactly what that economizer system does. Interesting. Not all of these have it. That's the SPA has it. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, is it time to go? You guys are restless. Three Three, well, then I can talk all I want. Um, yeah, that's the big MA45. Here? Where? No, go back to the web. Other way. There we go. That one. That one. Um, Is it just to filter? So yeah, it's just to filter the bleed air. So you're not getting gunk in your mm -hmm. air bleeds? Yep. All right, so that's Tuesday. I can write notes, I guess. We'll cover all this other stuff. Oh, yay, light.